want you to hit me as hard as you can. You're gonna be all right, Joan Wilder. Back in 1984, Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner jumped onto the mega A-list with Romancing the Stone. Written by former waitress Diane Thomas, the movie tracked the adventures of a plucky romance novelist named Joan Wilder, who sets off to Columbia on an adventure when her sister is kidnapped by some near duels who are looking for a priceless emerald called El Corazon. It turns out they're not the only ones, with a sadistic head of the secret police also looking. She's saved by a soldier of fortune named Jack Colton, who initially intends to fleece her of the jewel but winds up falling in love with her. At the end of the movie, they get the jewel, find each other, and sail off into the sunset aboard his boat, the Angelina. Perfectly capturing the Indiana Jones high adventure zeitgeist, the film was a major smash in March of 1984, grossing over $110 million worldwide. A big number for back then, as that was 11 times the budget. What made it an even bigger success was the fact that the film was widely expected to flop. Michael Douglas's power as a leading man at the time was fickle at best, with his recent The Star Chamber being a huge flop. Kathleen Turner was arguably the bigger star thanks to Body Heat. Robert Zemeckis, who was the director, was actually fired off of Cocoon, which was supposed to be his follow-up movie, after the studio saw the dailies for this movie. Thus, when it was a hit, Fox and producer Michael Douglas knew a sequel was a given. Friendly, aren't they? Drug runners. Just try to look mean. Buenos dias. However, the movie had proven to be such a success that a lot of the key creative team already got other jobs. Robert Zemeckis went on to do a little movie called Back to the Future, taking composer Alan Silvestri with him. Diane Thomas, whose screenplay was so well regarded for the first, went on to write Always for Steven Spielberg and also a draft of the third Indiana Jones movie. Nevertheless, everyone wanted a sequel, so Douglas hired screenwriters Mark Rosenthal and Lawrence Connor to write the script. While initially Douglas was unhappy with the title, thinking that the jewel was just going to be another treasure hunt, his interest was piqued when they revealed the jewel was actually a holy man. Nevertheless, Turner was disappointed Thomas wasn't back to write and refused to do the sequel, despite being contractually mandated to. The studio threatened her with a $25 million lawsuit, but Douglas intervened, hiring Thomas to consult on rewrites. The film was marked by tragedy, however, with an aircraft containing the production designer and production manager crashing during location scouting, killing all on board. Diane Thomas also tragically died in a car accident several weeks before the movie came out. The shoot in Morocco was tense, with many noting it was director Louis Teague's first time helming a big-budget adventure movie, with him mostly known for lower-budget genre stuff like Alligator, Cat's Eye, and Cujo. The movie, when it was eventually released, did very well financially, grossing almost as much as Romancing the Stone, but critically it was very maligned, and the franchise didn't continue after this. Now, while most people say that it's far inferior to the first film, I don't wholly disagree. Romancing the Stone was special, while this is obviously more of a cash-in proposition. That said, I still really enjoy it. For one thing, the concept is interesting. What happens after Happily Ever After? When we last saw Colton and Wilder, they were sailing away on his boat, the Angelina. When the movie opens, they've been traveling around the world, and Jim Wilder is kind of sick of their life together. Sure, it's romantic, but as she says early on in the film, how much romance can a girl take? I mean, Jack, this is just becoming a blur. I mean, exotic ports and great parties and spectacular sunsets. It's not enough. It's not enough? I mean, you sound like somebody who's got what they wanted and now they, they don't want what they got. Well, I want to do something serious. Serious, Hawk. Oh, Jack, how much romance can one woman take? So what happens is she gets convinced to go off and write the biography of a man named Omar Khalifa, who's kind of a charming Arab ruler of a part of Africa who wants her to write his memoirs. Now, of course, it turns out that Omar is evil and has actually kidnapped a holy man named the Jewel of the Nile. So what happens is Joan goes off to write the book, realizes how evil he is, takes the jewel and hightails into the desert, only to run into Jack Colton, who's come looking for her after Omar's men blew up his boat. And he's got Ralphie from the first movie, played by Danny DeVito, who was the bad guy in the first movie, but is kind of a good guy here, in tow. He's a swindler, and he wants a cut of the jewel, only he doesn't realize that the jewel indeed is a man, and neither does Jack. What follows is a lot of hijinks and a lot of adventure. There's a great chase in an F-16 fighter jet, which actually never takes off from the ground. They're just using the machine guns to kind of drive around the marketplace, and it's pretty awesome. 
There's a lot of good chases. There are a lot of fun sequences. And there's a great part where they run into a tribe and Jack Colton has to wrestle the tribe's toughest guy in order to win Joan's hand because the other guy, basically the, the, the prince of the tribe, wants to make her his betrothed. And what happens is Jack cheats his way by having the jewel distract everybody. And then Jack kind of nails the guy over the back of head with some pottery and pretends that he's won the match. I always thought that was pretty clever. Of course, there are a lot of misunderstandings along the way. Jack and Joan kind of break up for a little while, then get back together, then break up and get back together, and so on and so forth. But, you know, it's all very entertaining and kind of the same way the first movie was. There's a good score by Jack Nietzsche, and, uh, you know, it's just a fun movie overall. Michael Douglas is really good. Actually, has definitely a much more prominent role in this one than he did in the predecessor, which I could also understand might be the thing that kind of teed Turner off because she is kind of the damsel in distress in this movie, where she was much more of a heroine and hero right in the first film. Nevertheless, it's very romantic, and uh, the two have such good chemistry that even though this franchise didn't really continue, they continued to work together. They did the amazing War of the Roses with their co-star Danny DeVito also showing up in it and directing it, and then years later actually did, real recently, the final season of The Kaminsky Method. Douglas and Turner have always had amazing chemistry, and I'm glad that they kept working together, even though, you know, they may have had some, some financial fallings out due to the fact that Douglas is the producer on all of these movies. Jewel and I was definitely one of my favorite movies as a kid. I remember it used to air on the Canadian version of HBO, which was first choice all the time, and I just loved it. I remember also it used to be frequently on the ABC Sunday Night Movie, and man, I would just look forward to seeing it every time it showed up. I thought it was a great movie, and it's a movie I watched over and over again as a kid. Again, I realized that not everybody thinks it's a good movie and that most people think it can't hold a candle to romancing the stone but to me this is a really fun flick and well worth checking out if you want to see it it's pretty easy to find in canada it's on disney star and in the u.s you can find on a lot of other streaming services it's a lot of fun you should definitely watch the first movie first though because part of what makes this movie fun is just that it's the exploration of happily ever after and how happy actually is happily ever after There were always some rumors that maybe they would do a third installment of the series with Jack and Joan middle-aged and having children or something in tow, which would have been fun, but alas, it just never happened. Even still, these two movies are great, and War of the Roses actually makes for an interesting kind of third part to the franchise, even though it's completely different, and in fact made me cry as a kid because oh, they were so mean to each other in the film, I just didn't understand it. It's kind of a fascinating trilogy. I definitely recommend it, so check it out. So why don't we end things with a little Michael Douglas lightning round. Now, of course most of you have probably seen all of Michael Douglas' classic movies. You know, movies like Fatal Attraction, Disclosure, and of course Basic Instinct. Even Black Rain, which we did a best movie you never saw on a little while back. But there are a lot of good Michael Douglas movies out there that I think a lot of people have missed, so let's count down a couple of them. One of them, of course, is definitely The Star Chamber, which came out in 1983. In it, Michael Douglas plays a Superior Court judge who gets sick of seeing the guilty walk free after all of his trials, so he joins up with an underground secret society of vigilantes who all happen to be judges. It's a pretty cool little movie. Hal Holbrook, the great late Hal Holbrook, is the co-star along with the late Yafit Koto, and it's kind of a cool little flick by Pierre Himes, which I think, oddly enough, could be remade as a really cool movie nowadays. Another really good underrated Michael Douglas movie, which was actually kind of a classic when it came out in the 70s, is The China Syndrome. This one's about a nuclear meltdown and was actually pretty similar to something that actually happened at Three Mile Island just a few weeks after the movie came out. Michael Douglas is in full-on scruff mode playing a cameraman. He's got a crazy beard and crazy hair. Jane Fonda is really the star of the movie as the kind of TV reporter taking apart the conspiracy, while Jack Lemmon is absolutely amazing as the nuclear plant manager. A couple more really good Michael Douglas movies hardly anyone's ever seen include Shining Through. This is kind of a World War II mystery movie with Michael Douglas as a secret agent in the OSS whose secretary, played by Melanie Griffith, goes behind enemy lines in Germany. There are a lot of good gunfights in this movie, some good romance, a young Liam Neeson, and it kind of plays almost like a World War II version of Romancing the Stone or Jewel of the Nile. Another really good Michael Douglas movie that not a lot of people talk about these days is A Perfect Murder, which is actually a remake of a classic Alfred Hitchcock movie called Dial M for Murder and features Douglas as kind of this oily bad guy. In fact, one of the problems with Michael Douglas at this point was that he was always playing these kinds of greasy Wall Street guys. You know, these greed is good types, and I think Wall Street kind of typecast him in a certain way. But you know what? A Perfect Murder is actually a perfectly good murder mystery. And of course, there's also The Game by David Fincher, but I think that movie is kind of a classic at this point, right? 
If you want to see another Michael Douglas movie that was also kind of underrated, check out The Sentinel. It's kind of like 24 if Michael Douglas was Jack Bauer, and in it he plays an aging Secret Service agent who falls in love with the First Lady, played by Kim Basinger. And I mean, who could blame him? I mean, come on. And he has to fight a massive conspiracy. It was one of the last action movies that he ever made, and I like Michael Douglas in this one a lot. Anyway, those are a couple cool Michael Douglas movies you may not have seen. Well, you got your story. I got a lot more than that. And if you like this kind of content, make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all of your support. I get to getting. I smell a war burning across an ocean And in my backyard I feel hell rising Heaven falling, earth shaking Moving my soul I seen us a swirling Down the toilet, pollute the mother Poison us all, yeah I got this notion In my stomach 